Um, so these, these events are being recorded and will be uh, live on our iQuiz YouTube channel. Um, for bandwidth purposes, it's helpful if you keep your, your videos and your microphones off uh, until the end. Um, but of course, we encourage questions, so please uh, post them in the chat or, or raise your hand, and we'll try to relay your questions as we go. Um, and then at the end of the talk, you're, of course, welcome to turn on your video and, and join us for, for a discussion. Um, uh, so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Thompson, uh, joining us virtually from Princeton. Um, so Jeff did his, his undergraduate work at Yale. We already did quite, a, quite exciting results uh, demonstrating uh, optomechanical strong coupling in the group of Jack Harris. Uh, he then went on to do his master's and PhD uh, at Harvard with Misha Lukin, uh, also uh, co-advised by Vladin Vujicic. Um, he then did his PhD, or, or sorry, his postdoc uh, at MIT uh, kind of also with, with Vladin and a little bit with Misha, uh, they're, they're working on um, Rydberg, uh, Rydberg ensembles and quantum optics um, with Rydberg Adams. Uh, he's quant uh, won quite a few awards, uh, even during his PhD, uh, NSF graduate uh, research award and the Hertz. Um, and then as a faculty, of course, he's won many awards, including the AFOSR, uh, YIP, and, and the PK, the so Presidential Early Career Award, uh, the Sloan DOE Early Career Award, and recently NSF Career Award. And within the past few months, uh, he's been promoted to Associate Professor. Um, so it's really a pleasure to have uh, Jeff joining us today. And Jeff, please go ahead and get started. Great. Um, well, uh... Thank you all for, for coming to see this virtually, and I apologize that I couldn't come in person. Travel is still a little bit difficult um, these days, but, um, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity and, and look forward to having a chance to visit with some of you virtually this afternoon. Um, and thanks, Jake, for the, the invitation and the nice introduction. Um, so the, what I'm gonna talk about in my talk today is, is quantum computing with neutral atoms, specifically a terbium atoms, which is an approach we've been developing at Princeton. I wanna briefly start though, by giving a little bit of context for the rest of the work in my lab. So broadly speaking, I'm an atomic physicist and we work on developing new atomic physics tools for quantum science. So about half of my lab works on uh, atomic defects in the solid state uh, based on single rare earth ions. Um, integrated into nanophotonic cavities. And the real applications here are to quantum networks and quantum transduction, like ripped optical conversion. Um, and this has been a, a this has been an exciting uh, project in my lab. Um, it's not what I'm gonna talk about today though. What I'm gonna talk about is the other half of my lab where we work on Rydberg atom arrays and optical teaser really geared towards quantum computing. And so I wanna start by, um, by asking, you know, why, why we should build a quantum computer. I mean, maybe for this, this IQIST thing is not really necessary, but you know, I think the first and, and most important reason is to actually solve useful problems. You know, we know some algorithms. I, I, I believe that there are others once we have the hardware to do them that we will sort of discover. Um, but if that's not enough, there's also you know, quantum, uh, quantum computers are sort of a, an experimental lab for the emergent physics of qubits, you know, many body quantum dynamics um, and has connections to a wide range of fields. Um, and then the third, and I think maybe we overlook this one a little bit, is actually just to see if it's possible, you know, and, and in some way there's a framing of this problem from Umesh Fazrani that I really like, which is that you can sort of understand these kind of quantum advantage tests, quantum supremacy tests as a kind of a precision measurement of whether Hilbert space is really as complex as we think it is, because, uh, you know, the quantum, we just sort of, I mean, we, we wonder all the time about whether things like superposition and entanglement are real, but maybe we don't ask ourselves seriously enough whether, whether the exponentially large dimensionality of Hilbert space is real. Um, and a quantum computer is at least the only way I can think of that would actually probe that kind of thing experimentally. Um, so <clears throat> the, the broad field in which we're working is neutral atom quantum computing. Um, which is, has gotten quite hot, I would say, in the last couple of years. Um, and, uh, and so in the first, the next couple of slides, I just want to give you an overview of what kind of, what I mean by that, what the key components are. Um, so in a neutral atom quantum computer, the qubits are individual atoms that are trapped in individual tightly focused laser beams called optical tweezers. Um, using a variety of laser light show techniques, you can make big arrays of these optical tweezers and, and trap one atom in each of them. 
Um, <clears throat> the other things, and then, and actually also reconfigure the array dynamically um, in any geometry, change it in time, in real time. Um, gates uh, are implemented by focusing laser beams onto individual sites to, so that it's light that controls the gates. Um, and then, and two qubit gates specifically then are implemented using highly, highly excited Redbird states, which are strongly impacted. Um, and just to give you a sense of the scale at which we can build these systems, here is a recent picture from a paper from Misha Lucan's group showing a, a 256 site array of, uh, of, of single rubidium atoms. So <clears throat> let me walk you through some of these components. So the first component is an optical tweezer, um, which is just a tightly focused laser beam. And it, if you shine a tightly focused laser beam into a magneto optical trap, a laser cooled cloud of cold atoms, um, then you can basically observe single and, and collect fluorescence through a high NA objective, you can observe on a camera or on a photo detector um, fluorescence from single atoms in the trap. What's really interesting and was discovered by Philippe Granger about 20 years ago, really starting this field, is that if your trap is focused tightly enough, there's actually a process called light-assisted collisions that keeps two atoms from ever occupying the trap. So you have an empty trap, one atom rolls in from the mot, fluoresces, and then a second atom comes in and they kick each other out because they, they release some uh, some of the attractive <clears throat> force between them is kinetic energy. So you end up with the occupancy of this trap going back and forth between zero and one, zero and one, zero and one. And so this gives you a way to sort of prepare kind of sub, sub numbers of atoms in the trap. Um, and so if we, if we stopped loading one of these traps into this fold, then we would have just a single atomic qubit. Um, and these atoms then, once you load, uh, once you've gotten rid of the mot, once you've stopped trying to load new atoms, they can live in these optical tweezers for a very long time, just dependent on the vacuum, basically. You have the current record in a cryogenic vacuum chamber in the group of Antoine Barres is a two hour lifetime for a single atom in an optical tweezer. Um, however, if you have many arrays, you can't, it's not really so easy to stop loading them when you have an atom in all of them. You have sort of a musical chairs problem where when you turn off the mot, some of them are full, some of them are empty, and then you only have an array that's like half filled on average. And that's not a very good starting point for making a quantum computer. Um, but there's a technique that was pioneered by, by several groups uh, about five years ago to make deterministic arrays by taking a picture of the random loading in a particular shot of the optical tweezers and then dynamically rearranging the tweezers to sort of move all the filled sites to one side and all the empty sites to the other side. And so in 1D, this is conceptually very simple. If you just have an array of beams and you can change their spacing, you just sort of delete the empty sites and shift all the filled sites to one side. Um, but you can also do this with, with sort of additional tricks and multiple traps in, in 2D and even in 3D. This was demonstrated by Antoine Perret's group. Um, so there's really the potential to make defect freeze arrays of potentially, I think, thousands of atoms uh, with this approach. Um, so that's that's how you make the array of qubits. Um, neutral atoms, though, just sitting in their ground state are, are not, actually don't interact with each other. Um, so in order to engineer interactions, then the second key ingredient is exciting these atoms to highly excited states called Rydberg states. I don't know exactly where the Rydberg states start, let's say above n equals 20. Um, but once you get up into that high end range, then the Rydberg states have some universal properties that are, you know, independent of the particular atomic species you're using and just sort of depend on the, the principal quantum number. So the first is that the size of the, um, the electronic orbit gets big as, as you increase n. So for like a ground state atom in rubidium that might have n equals five, if that was this big, then the electron wave function for n equals 50 is this big to scale. So these are huge wave functions. Um, potentially micron sized orbits. Um, and because this electron is sort of so extended and, and sort of fluffy at that point, it, it's very polarizable. So the polarizability actually scales with the sixth power of the principal quantum number. And then the van der Waals interaction between two of these atoms, if you bring them close together, goes as the polarizability squared. So that actually grows as the 12th power of the principal quantum number. So, um, so by going from the ground state to this highly excited Rydberg state, you can, you can switch a, switch a very strong interaction on controllably and then switch it off when you come back down. And the kind of typical energy scale for this interaction is that if you go up to n equals 100, even at 10 microns, you still have a, you have a 54 megahertz interaction. So this is a very large, uh, large interaction. Um, the life, I should say, I guess it's important to compare this to the lifetime of these states and the lifetime of these states in this high end limit is in the range of 100 microseconds to a millisecond. So this is considerably, you know, three or four orders of magnitude faster than the lifetime. Um, so in order to, uh, right, and so the, the way in which we use this interaction is with a phenomenon called the Rydberg blockade, 
and it works like this. So if I have a single atom and uh, I just think about having one ground state and one Rydberg state, I can use a laser to excite it to the Rydberg state. And if I tune it to that resonance, I'll, I'll excite the atom. But if I, now this atom is located near a second atom that's already in the Rydberg state, uh, if these atoms are close together, then the, this one over R to the six van der Waals interaction will, will shift uh, the energy of, of this second atom and prevent me from being able to excite it with this laser. Um, so you can't excite both atoms when the separation between them is less than a characteristic length scale called the blockade radius. Um, and the blockade radius ends up going as, as n squared. Um, and so in, in kind of typical experiments, this for typical Rydberg states, typical robbery frequencies, this blockade radius is of order 5 to, to 10 to 15 microns. Well, it the spacing between optical tweezers is typically two, three, or four microns. So, so the important thing here is that this blockade radius is bigger, definitely bigger than one sort of lattice constant ray, but can also actually potentially be bigger than two or three. So you can have sort of meaningfully long range interactions um, you know, uh, spanning several lattice sites in the array through the Rydberg blockade. Um, so if you just have a, this two level atom with a ground state and a Rydberg state, actually just driving the system globally um, with a Rabi frequency already implements an, an interesting Hamiltonian, which is the transverse field icing model. And, and there have been a number of beautiful quantum simulation or many body dynamics experiments um, using, this, uh, using this platform. Um, and I'll just give an example here from, from the Broways group and, and the Lukin group. There were nice studies of the 2D icing antiferromagnet. And then more recently from the Lukin group, they sort of developed a, a very clever theoretical mapping to uh, to convert this Hamiltonian into an array of, of dimers, a dimer covering of a, of a triangular lattice where they could see signatures of a topological spin liquid. Um, but to actually implement quantum computing, this ground and Rydberg states are not enough because the qubit there is actually very short lived, limited by the Rydberg state lifetime. So instead, there's one more ingredient that we add, which is to actually use two different hyperfine ground states, two different spin configurations in the ground state to implement a qubit, and then selectively excite one of these states to the Rydberg state. And then using the Rydberg blockade, you can implement a two qubit gate. Um, uh, there's a, a, a couple of different ways to do this, but what they all rely on basically is that if I have, uh, if I have zero or one of the qubits in the one state, then I can successfully excite them to the Rydberg state. But if both qubits are in the one state, then I can't excite them both to the Rydberg state. And so you can use the, the difference in the Rydberg dynamics in this configuration and this configuration to implement, for example, a controlled Z gate. Um, and there's been a lot of progress in recent years on improving the fidelity of these operations. And the current record is about 97% um, from Michel Lucas group. Um, and, but I should point out the pioneering experiments were actually done more than 10 years ago by Mark Safin and, and Antoine Burroughs. So um, with these stable qubits and the ability to implement um, two qubit gates between them and, and also single qubit gates, then you can ask, well, how could I go and build a, an actual you know, programmable quantum processor where I can make different operations happen, actually implement a circuit basically. And the last couple of months have seen really exciting advances in doing this with two different approaches. Um, uh, Again, uh, the, the Lucan group at Harvard demonstrated a really clever approach where instead of actually focusing laser beams to implement the pattern of two qubit gates, they take advantage of physically moving the tweezers around to change the connectivity between the atoms. So, so um, in one arrangement of atoms, you know, this is a pair, this is a pair, and then with global illumination, you get controlled Z gates here and here, but these other atoms are just spectators. And then you change who's dancing with whom and, and then get a different pattern of gates. And so now just by moving the tweezers around, you can implement sort of arbitrary quantum circuits. Um, and then uh, the group of uh, Mark Safman in collaboration with Cold Quanta implemented a sort of a more direct approach where they actually just focused down the Rydberg excitation lasers onto different sites using the same kind of scanning acoustic optic deflector technology that was used to implement uh, the tweezer rearrangement. Um, these are actually quite complementary approaches and it's likely that they work well together. There's a reason to use both of them. Um, but it illustrates that you can actually implement, you know, start to build up large systems uh, with local control of this technology. So um, it, these have been really exciting developments for the field, but, but what I wanna now, I guess, to motivate the rest of my talk and what we're doing, I wanna highlight what I think are the main challenges that the field still faces going forward. Um, so the, the, the first and biggest one by far is the two qubit gate fidelity. So this, this 97 and a half percent record um, is a big improvement. On, on where it has been in recent years, but it's still not where you would like it to be for fault tolerant quantum computing. And it's also not close to the fundamental limits for what we should be able to achieve in this platform. Um, the fundamental limit comes from the finite lifetime of the Rydberg state and is definitely below three, you know, below three nines, better than three nines. I think 
Yeah. Um, and so what limits it instead is technical effects like Doppler shifts and laser phase noise. And, and these improvements have come mostly from beating those things down, but also doing things like cooling atoms. Better. The second is developing an approach to really implement scalable local control where you can rapidly implement many gates in parallel. And this turns out to kind of boil down to a photonics problem, how you can implement fast modulators and reduce crosstalk, things like that. But there's also atomic physics tricks that can help that. And then the third is actually having a realistic plan to do error correction for fault tolerant quantum computing, which includes some ingredients that haven't been demonstrated yet, like being able to do mid-circuit measurement, replacing atoms that are inevitably going to be lost during the operation, um, things like that. So in this talk, um, I'll tell you, I want to tell you about two, two lines of research in my lab that are related. The first is developing a new atomic platform for implementing qubits, um, which uses 171 atrobium. Um, that I think has a lot of technical advantages that will let us address these three aspects. And then in the second part of my talk, I want to tell you about a new approach to implementing quantum error correction that we call erasure conversion um, that we have um, thought through that, that is sort of specifically developed to take advantage of the physics of 171 atrobium and I think constitutes an additional big advantage for this particular atom and also for neutral atom quantum computing in general. So, um, so for atomic physicists, the periodic table is kind of like the toolkit. And a lot of times when, when you can't do something you want to do, there's a long history of, of going and finding another atom when you can't do something that you want to do. So um, the vast majority of the work on uh, neutral atom quantum computing so far has been with alkali atoms, and in particular with rubidium and cesium, although um, you know, Bryce and, and Jake have some nice recent work on potassium as well. Um, but these are kind of the workhorse atoms. Um, uh, and so, but but atomic physicists, you know, have have in the last 20 years journeyed over to the alkaline earth atoms to implement, for example, uh, atomic clocks and strontium and atrobium. Um, and, uh, and these atoms are just, they're kind of a sweet spot. They're just a little bit more complicated. They give you a lot of new functionality, but we can still understand. Um, so that's where we're going. Um, so these alkaline earth atoms, um, the main difference from the alkali atoms is they have two valence electrons instead of one. And that changes a lot about their electronic structure. Um, First, you get two completely different classes of optical transitions where you have within, um, because you have singlet and triplet states, you have transitions within the same spin sector that are very strong and allowed, and they let you have like bright fluorescence and do fast laser cooling. But you also have inner combination transitions between the singlet and triplet manifolds that are narrow line, and that also is advantageous for being able to laser cool to lower temperatures. For example. Um, in, in these alkaline earth atoms, the ground state is a, a J equals zero state. There's no electronic spin. So in an isotope with a nuclear spin, like 171 atrobium, which has a nuclear spin one half, that nuclear spin um, is essentially a degenerate qubit that's completely insensitive to magnetic and optical fields. So it's an ideal, ideally coherent qubit. There's also an optical clock transition to the lowest lying triplet state, which is metastable. And you can also imagine encoding a qubit in that state. And I'll talk about that at the end of our talk. Um, it has the same J equals zero property as the ground state. And lastly, the other thing that's interesting about having two electrons is that when you promote one of them into the Rydberg state, you still have another valence electron left inside the ion core. And that also has optical transitions that we'll use to, to great effect. Um, so I don't claim to have explained why every one of these features is interesting to you, but just that there are a lot of features in this, in this atom. Um, and I see it a little bit, these alkaline earth atoms, a little bit like a Swiss army knife, where you know when you buy one of these things, you don't know what all these things are for. For example, I, I don't know what this hook does. Um, but if I was lost in the jungle, I'm sure that I would find a way to use it. And so to the extent that you think that being you know lost in the jungle after a plane crash is a metaphor for the field of quantum computing right now, um, these alkaline earth atoms give us a lot of, a lot of tools to use for survival. Um, and, and our research has been finding ways to do that. So um, there's actually two alkaline earth atoms that it's pretty easy to laser cool and work with. Um, and, uh, and one is strontium and the other is a tribute. So strontium attracts a lot of attention for, for you know, in, in optical tweezers um, over the last few years. Um, the, the obvious advantage of starting these kinds of alkaline earth experiments with strontium is that it has really well-known properties. It's been very well studied, including its red birch states, et cetera. Um, and so, so uh, and I'll talk in the next slide about some beautiful work that's been done by, by Manuel Endres and Adam Kaufman and the company Adam Computing on, on strontium, um, strontium Rydberg qubits. Um, the challenge though for, for real quantum computing with strontium is that there's actually not a very good way to encode a qubit. So the only isotope with a nuclear spin has a nuclear spin one half, or sorry, nine halves, which has a lot of energy levels. Um, there's other ways of encoding qubits like on the clock transition, but, but optical qubits are, are sort of also difficult. 
So the other atom that, uh, the other alkaline earth atom that is well known uh, or easy to use is a terbium. And, and it has the, it fixes that one problem with strontium, which is that it's actually the only alkaline earth atom with a stable uh, I equals one half nuclear spin. So it's ideal, the ideal nuclear spin to implement a qubit. But the challenge for getting started with experiments with optical tweezers and Rydberg states is that actually the Rydberg states of the terbium are not very well known. Even though the basic laser cooling dynamics are, are well studied, there are big gaps in the data on the Rydberg states. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty about this at the beginning, but but we started working on this, you know, five years ago, mainly just to take advantage of this nuclear spin. And now, now Adam and then and also Jake and, and, and various companies are also um, working on a terbium. I'll point out that the next trick that atomic physicists have after um, alkaline earth atoms is to go to atoms with even more, you know, more electrons. And so, so one path that's been interesting in the quantum gas world uh, and is now also being pursued for optical tweezers are these open shell lanthanides. Um, so like dysprosium, dysprosium, holmium, and erbium. And there are actually experiments in, in various labs looking at these. And I think their Rydberg states are going to be really uh, rich and, and interesting. Um, uh, you know, it'll be an interesting thing to see in the future. So, um, so strontium um, was really, you know, strontium and optical tweezers was really pioneered by Manuel Endres and Adam Kaufman. Um, uh, and and there have been a lot of really beautiful demonstrations of, of what you can do with this atom, including implementing optical clocks in optical tweezers, which have, I think, actually the record coherence time. For, for even compared to optical lattice clocks because of even isolate the atoms from each other in the tweezers. Um, and, uh, and also um, in Manuel Anders's group, they really pushed the, you know, really set the kind of the new records for, for how coherent and how high fidelity of operations you can do on Rydberg states, which they were able to do in strontium because they could laser cool the atom to very low temperatures using the inner combination transition, eliminate Doppler shifts, and also use, uh, use single photon excitation to the Rydberg state, basically do very fast Rydberg rubbing. So the record entanglement fidelity for, for two atoms in Rydberg state, 99.1% was set in strontium. Um, so, um, so our terbium experiment though, um, we, you know, we started building around the same time. And, um, and so I, I like to walk you through that apparatus and our results on it. Um, these tweezer experiments have the benefit that as far as atomic physics experiments go, they're actually pretty simple. So um, our experiment starts with an oven and then a 2D mot on the blue transition where we cool the atoms uh, to about a millikelvin. And then we use a push beam to, to push the atoms into a 3D mot, uh, which is only on the inner combination line. Um, we actually let the atoms sag a little bit under gravity um, so that we can pick off this uh, the push beam and uh, basically block line of sight with a mirror here, um, which lets us operate this mod and push beam continuously without disturbing, having light scattering from the atoms in here. Um, the glass cell where we actually make our tweezers and do our experiments has, has, uh, has electrodes in it to control the electric field, um, which turns out to be very important for these grid work experiments. And then uh, here's a picture of our uh, but when we get everything working, here's a picture of our, our magneto optical trap on this intercombination line. And then if we turn on our optical tweezers and take a picture with the camera, we can see an array of atoms. Um, so the first thing you have to do uh, with atoms and tweezers is actually image them to see that they're there. And in a terbium, we had two choices actually for how to image. One was to use this broad transition um, at 399 nanometers, and the other was to use this narrower transition in, in the green, this intercombination transition. And naively, the broad transition emits photons faster, about 30 times faster. So it should, seems like it should be better for imaging. But the challenge with imaging neutral atoms is that the trap, the tweezers are not very deep. Um, so as the atoms scatter photons, they heat up from photon recoil. So you need to be continuously laser cooling them to keep them in the traps. Um, but the problem with this broad transition is that the Doppler temperature of millikelvin is actually comparable to or deeper than the typical trap depths we want to use. So we'd need, we'd need a lot of laser power basically to make traps deep enough to, to confine millikelvin hot atoms. So this narrower transition, because it has a narrow line width, has a Doppler temperature that's that's also quite a bit lower. And uh, and that, um, but, but yet this transition is not so narrow that we can't see atoms, so we don't get enough photons. So this 200 kilohertz wide transition turns out to really be a sweet spot, we think, for imaging where the, the Doppler temperature is uh, less than our tweezer depths, but it's still bright enough to see. And so um, we can actually image, get you know, enough photons to do very fast and high fidelity detection of atoms while keeping the, the temperature in the sort of 10 microkelvin range. In order to image on this narrow line transition, you need a magic wavelength, but coincidentally, 532 nanometers is a magic wavelength for, for 174 turbine at least. So, um, so it gets at a place where you can get a lot of power. And so using this narrow line imaging, we were able to demonstrate what was at the time a record for the, the imaging fidelity plus the probability that an atom survives the image, um, which is the important metric if you want to use 
uh, that image to rearrange atoms to create a defect free array. And that was about 99.6% um, in an imaging time that was very short by kind of standards uh, at the time, which was 20 milliseconds. Subsequently, Jake actually and, and Manuel did a little bit better with strontium, but um, uh, there's also room for improvement here. Um, so anyways, this narrow line sweet spot, uh, this narrow line is kind of a sweet spot for imaging, which was, uh, which is a, a first benefit of, of a turbine. So um, we're able to, because we have enough laser power at 532 nanometers, we're able to make pretty large arrays um, in 2D. Uh, if we made a 12 by 12 array, and if we just looked at a single shot of the image, we get this kind of disordered pattern. If we average over many shots, you see that all the sites are eventually filled. Um, uh, and then in right now we have the capability to re rearrange atoms in one dimension to make defect free arrays. Um, so here's a, I don't know, 20 or so site defect free array in 1D. Um, and then using an, an artistic technique known as collage, we can take many of these different images and put them together and make a 2D array um, in a picture, in this case, the Princeton logo. But I want to emphasize this is not actually a, two, a literal two-dimensional array of atoms. It's, it's 1D arrays plus, plus art. Um, so with these atoms and tweezers, then the, 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 the next challenge to address was figuring out where the Rydberg states were, because actually the main Rydberg state that we obviously, or that it seemed like we wanted to use, the triplet S1 state, had not been previously observed in a turbine at all. So we went on a long side project to do spectroscopy um, using our magneto-optical trap, um, doing two photon excitation at the Rydberg state, 556 plus 308. We were able to find you know, the line for one state and then actually find go and measure about 82 of these lines to, to map out that entire Rydberg series. Um, what you expect is that the energy of a Rydberg series uh, follows this, this Rydberg formula uh, where the energy goes as one over N squared, but there's this N is adjusted for quantum defect that varies from atom to atom and series to series and has to do with, with how the electron interacts with the core. Um, and so the main number is that, you know, for the 3S1 series, that quantum defect is about 4.438. Um, uh, this deviation at high end, we, we think is just from uncompensated electric fields at the time we did this measurement. Um, so it seems like this is a very simple number and you just get out that the answer is 4.438. Um, but it actually turns out that not every Rydberg series in these alkaline earth atoms is so simple. Um, so some of them are, have, are what are called perturbed series where the quantum defect is not constant as a function of energy to any approximation. And the triplet P1 series in a terbium turns out to have that property. This is some other spectra, other measurements that we did. So it's actually an important result that this triplet S1 series is, is sort of well-behaved. Um, these perturbed series should in general actually have shorter lifetimes because they have a mixture of lower end states in them. Um, so, so it was important to establish the long lifetime of this 3S1 series. Uh, Jeff, can I, can yeah. I interrupt real quick? Um, so we have a question from Paul. We, uh, how, how long does the 1D array uh, live or persist? Um, the life, if we don't do anything, the lifetimes of our atoms and our tweezers are around 10 seconds. And we think it's actually laser intensity noise. Our vacuum lifetime should be more like 30 seconds. So whether you want to define the array lifetime as that or that over N, um, the answer would be something, you know, yeah, that's, there's the information. But in contrast, our, you know, I want to point out that our Rydberg, you know, our rearrangement takes three milliseconds and our Rydberg gates take a microsecond. Okay, thanks. Um, so, right, so then now that we know where the Rydberg states are, we, we move to exciting Rydberg atoms and optical tweezers. Um, if we prepare an array with a large separation between atoms, uh, say 10 microns, um, and you know, use a Rabi frequency such that the blockade radius is not too big, we just see, we see all the atoms go to the Rydberg state and come back. Um, but if we now bring the, bring the atoms closer together and make this array of dimers where pairs of atoms are close to each other within the blockade radius, but then far removed from the next pair, then actually you see oscillations between, it, the, then now interactions play a role. So you see oscillations between the two atom state GG and this singly excited state GR plus RG, but that double excitation to the RR state is prohibited. And because of the sort of symmetry of this state, that actually the dipole moment is enhanced by a factor of the square root of two. So you see oscillations that are faster, square root of two times faster than in the isolated atom case, but only go down to one half because you can never excite both atoms in a pair to the Rydberg state. From the contrast of this oscillation, we can extract the fidelity of the, this Bell state that we create, and it's about 95% without span correction. But, but the real reason for doing those measurements is that by repeating them at different separations and looking at how the Rabi frequency changes, we can actually directly measure the C6 coefficient of the Van der Waals interaction strength. Um, and we get this value 
uh, for n equals 50 without context, this doesn't mean much. But the important point is there is a, a prediction for a terbium that at least the singlet at zero series would have sort of a pathologically small C6 coefficient. There would be a big problem for quantum computing. I mean, and this is right for the singlet S0 state. There was no prediction for the triplet S1 state because there was no data on it. Um, but but by actually now just going and measuring, and we still actually don't have enough data to really predict what the C6 coefficient could be because we don't know where all the P states are. But um, but in any case, using this measurement, we can see that the atterbium um, C6 coefficient is is large. In fact, it might even be slight, it's larger than strontium, it might even be a little bit larger than, than rubidium. Factors of two here don't really matter. The important point is that it's not pathologically tight. So this is another thing that is okay about a terbium. Um, actually, this measurement is for 174. These interactions are a little different for 171, but we also measured, measured that. Um, and then the last thing you worry about is the lifetime of these Rydberg states in heavy atoms, because the Rydberg states can mix with core excited states, which is called series perturbers that I mentioned previously. It is actually possible for the Rydberg states to have very short lifetimes. Um, so we using a, 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 the ability we have to actually trap Rydberg atoms for long times using the polarizability of the ion core, um, which we discussed in this paper, we're able to just directly measure the lifetime of these Rydberg atoms and optical teasers. Um, and we see that as uh, the low end states are not trapped, but for the high end states that are trapped, we see that we can measure, directly measure lifetimes of, of in excess of 100 microseconds for n equals 75. This is about two thirds of the value you would expect for rubidium. So there is probably some slight series perturbation shortening this, but this factor of two thirds is also not, not a very big deal. So all these measurements together, which took us a few years to do, lead us to the conclusion that as far as we know, it, you know, a terbium is actually okay. It'll actually work. Um, all of those experiments we did with the 174 isotope of a terbium, which doesn't have a nuclear spin, so we didn't actually have a qubit really to do anything. So in the last couple months, what we've come back to is, is, is trying to create arrays of 171 a terbium where we have an I equals one half nuclear spin and can do gate operations. And this was not a super direct translation of our 174 nanometer 174 terbium results because this magic wavelength that we were using to do this narrow line imaging actually is only for 174. The interaction of the tensor light shift and um, and uh, and the hyperfine coupling in 171 terbium means that that's not magic. So instead, you actually you know so expressed in terms of the polarizabilities of these different states, you know 532 nanometers crosses this line, which is magic for 174. But for 171, you need a wavelength that crosses this line somewhere. And the theory, these matrix elements in a terbium are not very well known. Um, so we actually had to just go and do, again, a bunch of spectroscopy and tweezers at different wavelengths to really figure out where this magic wavelength was. But, um, but then in the end, we were able to find that it's 46.8 nanometers, which is a really nice turquoise color. Um, you can actually also get a lot of laser power there um, with doubled, uh, doubled solid state lasers. And, uh, and by working on the imaging here, we're able to do now basically as well as we could do with 174 turbium, um, about 99.3% fidelity and survival. In, again, in a fast 20 millisecond exposure time. Um, so then we want to implement a qubit in the nuclear spin ground state. Um, so let me walk you through the, the operations. The first step is optical pumping. Um, the way we do that is on this inner combination line, uh, we take advantage of being able to apply a magnetic field that is big compared to the line width of these states, which is very small. So even I think this is like a four gauss field, but it shifts these lines by about 30 gamma with respect to each other. And then using circularly polarized light, we can we can optically pump into this state and the excitation out of the one state with circularly polarized light is just detuned by 30. So, so this becomes effectively a dark state to good approximation. And then in this few gauss magnetic field, um, the zero and one nuclear spin state split by, uh, by a couple kilohertz and then using an audio frequency coil, which we actually drive with like a, you know, an audio amplifier that we bought from, you know, Best Buy or something like that. We can, uh, we can drive Rabia oscillations on the nuclear spin. Um, and, uh, and then if we, you know, instead of just driving Rabia oscillations, actually construct gate pulses and implement randomized benchmarking, we can see that the fidelity of these operations is, is, uh, is about 99.96%, um, which is actually just limited primarily by the lifetime of the atoms. Um, I guess I want to point out that there's a, a, a at the same time we, we posted our results on this, Adam Kaufman had also a nice paper on, on nuclear spin operations in, in 171 attribute. Um, so then the next question is, what is the coherence time? Um, so using Ramsey experiment, we measure T2 star and we get uh, 1.25 seconds. That's maybe actually not as long as you would expect for an atomic qubit, you know, especially if you're coming from the solid state world, you expect atoms to just be perfect and have infinite coherence. Um, but actually maybe one of the dirty secrets of tweezers is that uh, the, 
the differential light shift between the sort of typical clock states used in alkali atom qubits is about 10 to the minus three. So the trap depth is very slight, is about 0.1% different for the zero state and the one qubit state. And now if your atom is at finite temperature and it's moving around, that basically gives you a fluctuating, uh, fluctuating effective field on the atom. So actually in rubidium and cesium optical tweezers, typical coherence times are T2 stars are only a millisecond. So this is actually about a, a thousand times longer than that. And what it comes from is the fact that this degenerate nuclear spin qubit with no hyperfine coupling in the ground state doesn't have any differential light shift. We've measured it to be actually 10 to the minus seven. And we don't even understand where that comes from, but, but it's, it's four orders of magnitude smaller than, than what you get in alkali atom qubits. Um, with a photon, with, with, a, with an echo then T2, it goes up to about five seconds. We think this is actually limited by just slow magnetic field noise from our, our home-built current controllers. And then T1 is essentially limited by the, by the lifetime of the atoms um, and, um, and also a little bit of resonant light leakage. Again, because there's no hyperfine coupling in this ground state, Raman scattering, spin flips from Raman scattering are very highly suppressed and theoretically should occur at the level of 10 to the minus 13 hertz from the diving trap. To implement two qubit gates, we use the same trick as we did for optical pumping, where we apply a magnetic field to generate a Zeeman shift now in the Rydberg manifold, um, where, where F is a good quantum number. Um, and so with that same four Gauss field, we're able to shift these two Rydberg states by about uh, 11 uh, times our Rabi frequency, which gives us a very selective coupling now from the one state to the Rydberg state, but not from the zero state, because this detuning is large. Um, uh, this is a little bit upside down from, from, from alkali atom qubits, where you actually usually rely on a splitting in the ground state to, to do selective coupling to the reverb state, but this works just as well. Um, to implement then a two qubit gate, we use the symmetric geometric phase gate called the LP gate from, from Misha Lukin's group. Um, and let me, it's a very actually beautiful and elegant gate protocol. And let me explain to you briefly how it works. So um, it, it, uh, it, it's based on the, the you, to understand it, you want to think about the dynamics of two atoms on the, on the block sphere, um, where this is the, all the atoms in the ground state, and this is whatever goes to the river state. So in the case that you have a, and, and so this gate consists of two pulses that are detuned with a little bit of a phase slip between them. Um, and so the detuning is chosen such that in the case that you have in the first pulse, in the case that you have both atoms in the Rydberg state and you undergo Rabi oscillations at root two omega, you make this detuned arc and come all the way back to the south pole of the block sphere. But if you're in zero one, because your Rabi frequency is slower, you actually don't make it all the way back and you stop here. But then in the second pulse, you put in this phase slip and now the zero one state because of that phase slip starts again on a different trajectory and by the end of the pulse comes back down to the bottom whereas the one one state just does exactly the same trajectory again um, and so because of the different areas enclosed on the block sphere in the zero one and one one cases um, they pick up different phases they come back to themselves but they pick up different phases and if you choose this detuning and this phase slip correctly then you, you can implement uh you can have these phases work out such that you implement a controlled state um, where the phase on this State a controlled Z gate plus a single qubit phase. Uh, so we so we implemented this experimentally, and the populations during the gate evolved sort of as you would expect. Um, and then to estimate the fidelity of the gate, we can look at both the population in the ground states uh, at the end of the gate and the the, co the coherence of parity oscillations to, to measure the phase. And what we find is a CZ gate fidelity of eighty five percent, which actually goes down to eighty three percent when you include spam correction for leakage to the river. Um, so while this is not the, the, you know, by any means the record fidelity for Rydberg gates, um, it's, uh, it's limited by technical effects that we understand pretty well, including laser noise and photon scattering. Um, and I think we have a very clear path to, to improve it, which is, which I'll outline on this slide. So, um, the, the step we're working on right now is instead of encoding qubits in this 1s0 ground state, we want to instead encode qubits in this 3p0 metastable state. This state has a lifetime of 20 seconds which is, you know, I mean, longer than our atom lifetime anyways uh, in vacuum, um, but gives us a couple of really important advantages for, um, uh, for, our, for, for quantum computing. Um, the first that's most relevant for gate fidelity is that by being able to do single photon excitation to the Rydberg state instead of two photon excitation through 3P1, which we were doing before, we should be able to do our gate operations 10 times faster, 10 to 20 times faster, um, just by having a higher robbing frequency, which lets us not only avoid spontaneous emission from the intermediate states, which contributed maybe three or 4% to our infidelity, but actually suppress technical noise like Doppler shifts, uh, you know, intensity and Doppler shifts and, and laser detuning errors, laser phase noise by a factor of this 10 to 20 squared. So it's like a factor of 100 to 400 
Um, and, and those are actually the things that were the main limitations for you. So by doing the gates faster, you're less sensitive to spontaneous decay and, uh, and technical noise. Um, this metastable state um, also actually has important consequences for error correction, which is what I'll talk about next in my talk. Um, and then the other thing that we're working on now um, in the lab is implementing local addressing using um, a novel approach that's based on light, instead of focusing the Rydberg beam locally, focusing a, a light shifting beam locally that actually light shifts the Rydberg state by coupling it to another Rydberg state with an excited atrium ion core. And we've demonstrated this in proof of concept um, in this recent work, and now we're implementing a, a, a sort of a, a beam system to actually be able to, 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 to locally control gates using this approach in a in sort of a 10 by 10 array. Um, this is based on an SLM and a DMD. Um, so that's that's kind of the that's what we've what we've built and what we're doing on the hardware side. In the, the next part of my talk, I'd like to tell you about how we think what we think is a really good approach to doing uh, error correction actually for fault tolerant quantum computing with this platform. But maybe this is a good time for me to pause for a second for any questions on the first part. Yeah, Jeff, I have one question about um, moving to the clock state for your qubit transition. Mm -hmm. um, is there enough power available at the magic wavelength you would need to, for that transition to have large arrays, or would you be limited by um, the power available at 759 nanometers? Yeah, there's probably not. Um, and so we're not actually driving the clock transition where our plan is to instead um, prepare a population in that state by incoherent pumping through other intermediate states. I see. But then wouldn't that also, uh, then do you just turn the tweezers off during the river transitions? Uh, uh, yeah, well, if depending on how fast your river gates are, you know, you might not care so much about those light shifts. There's also um, techniques like modulating the, I mean, I guess the turning off, but you can, you know, you can sign you certainly modulate the intensity too. And that's a lot more, uh, a lot less destructive for the atoms than just turning it off. Right, okay. Other questions? Okay. Um, so in the next part of my talk, um, what I'd like to tell you about is uh, an approach um, for efficient quantum error correction using a technique we called erasure conversion that we've developed for 171 Atterbium. We actually think it may be applicable to other qubits as well. This project was a collaboration between myself, uh, Shimon Kolkowitz at Madison, another you know, experimentalist, and then uh, Shruti Puri and her student Yue Wu at Yale for uh, error, you know, theorists with, with deep expertise in, in quantum error correction. Um, so, okay, so fault tolerance um, you know, in classical or quantum computing is the notion that you should, by redundantly encoding your information, your bits into multiple bits or your qubits into multiple qubits, you should be able to do computations that are resilient to errors in your elementary operations. Um, and, uh, and, um, and yes, and, and, and then the key, so the key idea in, in, in fault tolerance is that, you know, when you, when you do this redundant encoding, you of course now have to do more and more physical operations for logical operations. So you're only gonna win um, by using larger and larger encoding if your physical error rate is below some threshold. Um, and, uh, and it was proven um, in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s that such a threshold exists for quantum computers, but at the time, uh, using concatenated codes, the threshold was believed to be in the range of 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus four. And that was a real bummer at the time because, um, you know, two qubit gates were anywhere close to that threshold. It's also a real bummer now because two qubit gates aren't still anywhere close to that threshold. Um, but fortunately in the intervening time, Kataev and, and, and others um, developed uh, a family of topological codes which have actually much higher thresholds, um, the 1% level. And that's really exciting now because in, in many platforms including neutral atoms, but also others, you know, two qubit and other gate errors are actually now hovering around that level. Um, so this seems like something maybe we could actually do. Um, I'm not going to talk about you know error correcting code, including the surface code, in, in detail. But it's a sort of planar layout of qubits, the measure stabilizers. Um, but I do want to explain on this graph that what the you know the notion of a threshold is. So this is a, a, a simulation for the surface code, looking at the error rate of a logical qubit encoded in surface code patches of different sizes, which sets the code distance as a function of the physical error rate. And you see that if your physical error rate is low, your logical error rate goes down as you increase your 
you know, the amount of redundancy, the size of the service code from three to five to seven to nine, et cetera. But if your physical error rate is too high, you actually make things worse um, uh, by using more redundancy. And so the, the place where you switch from making things worse to making things better is this threshold. So fault tolerant computing works below this threshold. Um, So one really interesting line of investigation in, in you know, error correction now is whether, you know, when you look, instead of looking at an abstract model of a qubit, whether you look at a particular, if you look at a particular physical qubit, is there some structure in the noise that makes error correction easier than the general case? And one extremely well-studied and exciting example of this is biased noise, um, where if you have a, a preponderance of Z errors over X errors, um, then you can actually have much higher thresholds. So this occurs naturally in kind of bosonic type qubits and superconducting cavities. Um, and in, in particular cases of Kerkat qubits, this sort of nonlinear driven, uh, nonlinear parametric oscillator, you, um, uh, it's been predicted that you could have a threshold as high as 6% for the surface code. Um, and this is actually work from, from Shruti Puri, our, our collaborator. And there's also a nice paper from Isha Lukin's group recently pointing out that in, in Rydberg atoms, you, you also should be able to realize some kind of a noise bias for errors decaying from the Rydberg state. Um, but bias preserving, taking advantage of bias noise at the circuit level in general is challenging because you actually need then to build your circuit for error correction entirely out of gates that preserve a noise bias that don't convert um, Z errors into X errors. And so one gate that does that is Hadamard. So so it's actually quite challenging to be able to build error correcting circuits without, without unbiasing the noise. Um, so to, to motivate the particular structure and the noise that we're gonna try to take advantage of here, I wanna tell you about uh, two, actually two, two different types of, of noise models that you can consider for, for bits in the abstract. The, the model that we, that we usually consider for, for both classical bits and qubits is the depolarizing channel where zero goes to one and one goes to zero. Um, and so uh, the classical, the simplest classical code that um, handles depolarizing errors is a, is a repetition code, a distance three repetition code, where I would use 0, 0, 0 to encode the logical zero state, 1, 1, 1 to encode the logical one state. And then if I have a single error, I can both see that I have an error and using majority vote, I'll correct it back to the initial state. If I have two errors though, I will still see that I have an error. I know that these are all wrong, but using majority vote, I'm gonna correct to the wrong state. So for, um, so in this code, I can correct one error and detect two errors. And in general, if I had a distance D code where I just repeat D times instead of three, I can detect D minus one errors, but only correct half that. So another physical model for errors though, is something called the erasure channel instead of the depolarizing channel. And what, uh, what the erasure channel means is that instead of zero going to one and one going to zero, when there's an error, both of those states just go to some third state that just says, hey, there was an error. X, so it's you know smudged or something like that, and so with this kind of erasure noise, um, I can actually uh, correct not only one error but also two errors, and I can even detect three errors, even though I can't correct it. So this actually lets me detect one more error than the depolarizing channel, but really importantly, correct twice as many errors as the depolarizing channel. Um, so. Uh, yeah, and this is this is true. This repetition code, but it's actually generically true that any quantum or classical code can correct twice as many erasure errors as depolarizing errors. So um, uh, erasure errors are actually very common in classical data. For example, if you know if a doctor writes you a prescription with bad handwriting, you don't often get the wrong medicine; you just don't get any medicine. Um, uh, and and similarly, if you have like say electrical components or hard drives that fail, you know you don't read a set of garbage bits; you just don't get any data. Um, actually, erasure uh, quantum codes over the erasure channel are very well studied in the context of quantum computing too in the world of photonic qubits, either for quantum communications or, or LOQC. Um, and in this case, um, the way erasures arise is that if I have a qubit that's encoded, for example, in polarization or path or something like that, I would have, um, you know, I would, when I try to measure that qubit, I get a click here. If it's V, I get a click here. If it's H, but if I get no clicks, that heralds an erasure error. I just know that the photon is lost. <laughs> Um, and so actually one of, you know, there's then a number of exciting results about error correction with, with erasure errors, including the fact that the, as a quantum memory, the surface code actually has a threshold of 50% under pure erasure errors, which actually saturates the bound imposed by the no cloning. Um, so what we set out to do was to ask if there was a way that we could engineer our qubits so that the noise, that kinds of errors, the fundamentally limiting errors we have would manifest as erasure errors instead of as depolarizing errors. So we could take advantage of the fact that these are much easier to correct. 
Um, so in Rydberg qubits, the fundamental limitation to the two qubit gate fidelity is the finite lifetime of the Rydberg state. This over the time of your gate, this state has some probability to decay. Um, but what we started asking ourselves is, okay, well, where do those decays go? And so in this simple sort of three level diagram where I use these two, I have only two ground states and I use them to encode my qubit, this Rydberg state has to decay back down to these ground states basically. And then that's gonna be a depolarizing error because I'm gonna be back in the qubit manifold, but I don't know what state I'm in. Um, but our kind of idea was in a turbium at least to instead use this metastable 3p0 state as our qubit level. And then the true ground state actually sits below there. And then if you actually just look at the matrix elements and the branching ratios in a turbium, it turns out that uh, about a third of the decays from the Rydberg state go to the ground state instead of into this 3P0 state. And to do this, you have to repump the 3P2 and some other states, but um, but you basically get about a third of the decays coming down here. And when that happens, you can detect those events immediately by shining light on this 1S0 to 1P1 transition at 399 nanometers on the array. This light doesn't disturb qubits in the metastable state at all. It's detuned by 100 terahertz for many transitions there. Um, so, uh, so you can detect decays to the ground state immediately with high fidelity. And this basically converts them into erasure errors because you know that an error happened. The other two thirds of the decay actually are primarily black body transitions to other Rydberg states. Um, and these we can also detect um, by uh, exciting the core electron inside that a terbium atom, um, which then results in a very, the very rapid creation of a terbium plus ion through a process called autoionization. And we can also detect these a terbium plus ions using fluorescence on the 6S, uh, 6P transition at 369 nanometers in that ion. This detection process is also, also doesn't affect atoms in this state um, because again, this light is very far detuned from transitions. Um, so if we can detect this 34% and this 61%, then actually that only leaves 5% of the atoms that decay back into the qubit subspace. So we've converted a very large fraction of the potential errors into errors that we can see. And only this 5% we can't see and have to deal with, with, uh, with syndrome measurements. Um, I do wanna point out that, that using metastable states for trapped ions um, for reasons that are analogous to or, or synergistic with those we've discussed here has been, has been discussed in several previous reports. Um, so to actually understand the, the so the question we really want to know then is what fraction of all the errors that would have been become erasure errors instead of depolarizing errors. And it actually turns out it's a little better than that 95% because some of the times you decay back to this, the qubit subspace, you then get re-excited during the rest of the gate. So if you actually do a master equation simulation of the whole gate, what you find is that the, the gate, the total gate error gets you know, better and better as you make your gate faster. Um, but if you then condition on not detecting a decay, it's actually always about 50 times better. Um, so kind of, you know, if I, I said earlier that the, with kind of state of the art parameters, we think you should be able to get to a gate fidelity of about three nines. Um, this, in that case with a terbium, we think then the conditional fidelity uh, actually would be, uh, or conditional error uh, would actually be closer to two times 10 to the minus five. Um, so to really quantify how this works at the circuit level, um, we, we work with Shruti uh, to simulate the, to actually do a circuit level simulation of an error corrected code. We use this XCZX surface code. And the way we imagine this working is that after every two qubit gate, we send in a brief pulse of light on this ground state and this ion transition to detect whether any population has been transferred into those states. Um, and if not, then we see no erasures. We continue with the gate. If we did see any of those atoms light up, then we know that they had an error and we, those atoms are now lost too, but we replace them with atoms from a reservoir um, and then carry on. And then at the end of the day, when we're doing our syndrome measurements and go to decode them, we have not only the results of these measurements, but also the location of these errors that makes it easier to decode. Um, I want to point out that in our simulations, we actually replace these atoms right away. I think in practice, you could defer that, uh, you know, batch these and defer them until later in the circuit. Um, and so the result of this simulation is that this XEZX surface code with pure depolarizing errors has a threshold of about 0.9%, but with 98% of the er errors converted into erasures, this goes up by a factor of four or five to, to, to 4%. Um, so this is a huge increase in the threshold. Another way to look at this is that if you pick you know, any particular physical error rate that you think you would have had, you can see that at, you know, even at modest code distances, the reduction in the logical error rate is many, many orders of magnitude. Um, the, this uh, improvement in the threshold actually is kind of a smooth function of the fraction of errors that are converted into erasures, but it definitely helps to be, you know, very close to one. It's actually 5.1% for pure erasures. 
In addition to the threshold going up, actually the, the code distance to basically the number of errors you could correct also gets larger. And that's manifest as the slope of the logical error probability with the physical error probability. And so as this erasure fraction increases, that also goes from D over two to D uh, basically. Um, and so that lets you get the same code distance with fewer qubits. Um, maybe just to I want to make one more brief comparison between this erasure conversion and bias noise. Um, if I don't have either of these things, just a depolarizing model, um, then I have, say, a five qubit code. I, when I go to look for errors with a syndrome measurement, I have 15 errors, possible errors to look for, x on each qubit, y, z. If I have bias noise, then I, it's very unlikely that I had a, an x or y error, so I really only have to discriminate between these five possibilities of having a z error on these different um, different qubits. But if I have uh, an erasure model, then what I know when it comes time to do the decoding is which qubit had an error. Um, and so actually now I have only three possibilities to distinguish between. And, and if I, if this code grows from five to, to 10 to seven, this stays as three. Um, so so this, this is sort of a, another picture intuitively of why this, uh, why this erasure, uh, erasure errors are easier to correct. To make a quantitative comparison to bias noise, if I have a, a bias of about 100, which is kind of comparable to this 98% erasure conversion, the XEZX service code has a threshold of 2.2%. Um, it's about half what it is with erasure conversion. But then importantly, erasure conversion doesn't require these fancy bias preserving kits. So I want to maybe then uh, sort of make a few kind of concluding remarks about this erasure conversion. So while we studied it in the context of uh, the surface code and a particular gate protocol, None of it, it really depends on that. This should work for any, any error correcting code, give you similar benefits for any error correcting code um, and any kind of two qubit gate you do, these rigorous atoms. Um, uh, while we focused on the fundamental errors, which are the decays from the rigorous state, those actually aren't the errors that dominate current neutral atom experiments. In fact, current experiments are basically entirely dominated by coherent errors like laser noise, Doppler shifts, things like that. However, we have a, you know, a, a, a belief and now also some preliminary results that you actually can, by designing your gate sequences carefully and doing uh, kind of optimal control, actually make it so that you convert the majority of those errors into erasure errors as well, by making sure that when your gate goes wrong, what happens is not that you come back to the qubit subspace in the wrong state, but that you get stranded in the Rydberg state, which then we detect as an erasure. And I think you can also extend this to single qubit gates, actually, even in some sense, crosstalk and readout. And so it's now kind of a project that we have to figure out how to convert as many errors as possible into this favorable type. Um, this isn't actually a totally crazy idea to use this metastable state. In fact, you know, Jake and others were already interested in doing this for your ability to do mid-circuit readout and reloading new atoms and, and things like that. So this is sort of synergistic with the direction that the field is headed anyways. Um, and I think you might be able to apply these atoms to other qubit platforms, um, as well, these ideas to other qubit platforms as well. In particular, ions have a lot of the same metastable state structure. Um, yeah. Um, so I had one, I wanted to do one more quick thing, but I'm just going to skip it then. Um, and so what I'd like to conclude then by saying is that, you know, I think it's actually a really exciting time for, for quantum computing, people building big systems in a lot of different platforms. Um, neutral atoms are, I mean, I don't know if it's fair to say they're an up and comer anymore, but I think we have thought about them a lot less. Um, than other platforms. And there's a lot of really exciting things, I think, to do. This, this error correction, this sort of efficient error correction is one example, moving qubits around to change the connectivity dynamically and implement different codes is another direction. Um, and so, so I think this is a really fertile, fertile playground um, for the next few years. Um, I'd like to conclude then by thanking the people in my lab, Jack and Sam built this experiment, Shuo, Alex, Yichen, and Genu are sort of the current, um, you know, the current, uh, the current team. Um, generating all the results I showed you here. Um, and then I'd like to thank you for your attention.